when we got married, I thought to myself, I'll never be alone again. There's going to be tough times in life, but I'll always have this wonderful supportive person to help me through it. And then I had this ordeal that lasted years where I was alone. I didn't have that person. And it's even worse because I know, I know her so well and we built our lives around our kids and all we wanted was to build a loving home and a supportive place for our kids to, to grow up. And she would be crushed to see how her behavior and her actions were affecting our kids. What happens when this serious mental illness in your family happens to your spouse, your partner, your significant other? This is the episode you've been asking us for as we examine with guest Patrick Dillon, author of Safe, Wanted, and Loved, what happens in the family when your partner goes from partner to stranger. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Finally, a place to talk about the truth. This is our 66th episode, and many of our listeners have written to us or contacted us on our Facebook page and saying, when are you going to talk about we know you're all moms, you're three moms in the trenches, but can you do an episode on what it feels like from the spouse point of view when you're losing your partner, when you have to keep not only your spouse safe and wanted and loved, but to keep your children safe and wanted and loved? What's it like when your partner becomes a stranger? This is episode 66, Mental Illness in Your Spouse or Significant Other, and our guest, Patrick Dillon is the author of Safe, Wanted, and Loved, winner of seven awards, including a National Indie Excellence Award and Best Indie Book. That's a big, big deal. And former U.S. Rep. Patrick Kennedy, who is such an advocate for mental illness, says anyone out there struggling to navigate mental illness should read this thoughtful book. So if you're watching on YouTube, Patrick's right here and say hello. We're going to- thank you gonna, for having me. Really appreciate the invite. You're welcome. We're going to grill you in a second. Who are we? We are three moms with three sons. Each of our sons has schizophrenia. We've written three books and occasionally we do a little update. I have nothing really new to report. So Mindy, you do though. Can you share? I have two news tidbits that both have to do with this podcast, the intersection of our lives with the podcast. And one is the NAMI National Convention is in Minnesota next week in Minneapolis. And I've been contacted by one of our previous guests to have dinner. And it's Joe Cochran, who um, is with, as you remember, Clubhouse International. Yes. And heading up an effort in my county to have a clubhouse in our county. And so he and Jack Lasko, who is another international um, muckety-muck in that group, uh, will be joining me and a couple of others that I've invited here for dinner. So that came about because of this podcast. The second thing is we were all three of us moms contacted um, recently by a young filmmaker by the name of Aiden Keltner from San Diego, and he's actually in my house right now. He came um, from uh, California to, to talk to a group of moms that I put together this afternoon. We had nine moms here in my right behind me in the couch, and then he is doing background information for a film that he's making, <clears throat> excuse me, on um, a mother caretaking her son who has uh, schizophrenia. So he is now making a longer film and he wanted, he's, he met with, I connected him with some moms in, in uh, California that Mimi and, and Randy would know. But he also, uh, I had said, if he ever did come to Minnesota, I would put together this group. And so we did, and they were all women I know really well. And I learned things from them with his probing questions. We all thought it was worth it because he's 21, you know, but well wise beyond his years, and he will be doing films for a good long while. So we wanted to, we were honored to have a chance to educate him. So both all because of this podcast. 
That that is wonderful. Um, I am absolutely thrilled. I have spoken to Aiden. We had a little Zoom call. So he said uh, that. Yeah. I'll tell him if he ever comes to Connecticut, I'll get some more people to talk to. <laughs> okay. And I said someday when he gets his longer film done, you know, we would definitely want to have him on the show. And he said he would be delighted. Wonderful. And it, there is so much advocacy out there. It's it's a fabulous thing. So thank you. And happy Mother's Day to mm -hmm. all. For those of you who helped your wife become a mother and for all of us. And so um, I've sort of introduced our guest on basically a little more background. Oh, let me hold the book up. I've got post-it notes all over it. Here's the book. <laughs> Safe, Wanted, and Loved by Patrick. More post-it, more uh, tapes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you win the post-it wow. contest. <laughs> A family memoir of mental illness, heartbreak, and hope. We have in common in our books that we both have hope in the subtitle. Um when a sudden mental illness struck his wife, Patrick Dillon found himself living with an eerie stranger. Scared and unprepared, aren't we all? He began a desperate battle to protect her from a mysterious disease, shelter their children from her bizarre behavior, and recover the woman that he fell in love with. And so as part of his book, he joins the voices calling for an end to the stigma surrounding mental illness. Just so you know, the end of the story, he and his wife, Mia, live in Florida. They have two college-aged children, and they're still married, and hope that sharing the story will spread awareness. So welcome, Patrick Dillon. Thank you. Thanks very much. So before you share your story, and we're going to, we probably will interrupt with questions because that's what that's we do, fine. <laughs> but we, we, we want to know I I've actually in the intro said a lot of it, but before you share your story, can you can you tell us what you most hope people will get and learn from hearing about this? Yeah, I mean, we chose to share our story probably in a similar way that the three of you chose. We, you know, the stigma is so destructive. It makes a very stressful, difficult situation that much harder. And so we just, yeah, and also I think compounded by the fact that there's really no real good accurate depiction of psychosis in pop culture for the most part. I mean, there are our books and others like ours, but when you look at movies, when you, when you, you know, read Stephen King novels or whatever, the one, you know, the person who's psychotic is usually the bad guy. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, the reality of psychosis is different than that. And our hope is that, you know, people will be drawn in, not just for a good story about mental illness, but just a good story. And that maybe we could bring in some people that otherwise hadn't experienced psychosis, so they could better understand you know, what it's really like. And, you know, it's hard to break such a strong stigma, but the only way we have a chance of doing it is if we share our stories. So that, that was the reason. Look, there's a, there's a number of other reasons why we chose to do it. Um, but that I think that's the primary reason. All right. Well, tell us your story. Sure. So you kind of read through the little synopsis there, but um, when my wife uh, it was actually the morning of her 39th birthday, um, she was, uh, you know, we don't have any history of mental illness in either of our families. So far as we know, we had no experience with it. Uh, she was fine one day. Uh, and the next, uh, she woke, well, she didn't wake up. I don't think she slept, but I woke up and she had had a psychotic break sometime in the middle of the night. She was suffering acute psychosis. Um, so mainly paranoid delusions, but other symptoms that unfortunately the four of us know so well. And it was um, a, a huge uh, shock. Uh, we, you know, I had no, no idea this was coming. And uh, we had two young kids at the time, nine and 11. Uh, and so the book is about, you know, how the, how I dealt with that, that all the challenges that come along with it, many of which, unfortunately, you, you know, as well. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, it started us down the path of six really difficult months of psychosis in and out of very, very acute illness. And then years of, of suffering through these psychotic episodes and you know, trying to figure out what was going on, and 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 find a treatment plan that might work, and supporting our kids through that, and 
and, and dealing with everything else that goes along with, with this kind of crisis. So, you know, the mental health, uh, mental illness support network and psychiatrists and therapists and fighting with insurance companies and dealing with pharmaceutical uh, prescriptions and, you know, all, everything that goes along with it and try to capture that in a way that would be, um, you know, something that um, anyone would find compelling. When I was dealing with this, uh, I was trying to find any book about mental illness that offered some hope, and it was hard to find. And spoiler, ours is a very happy ending. <laughs> so, so I wanted to, we also wanted to, you know, let people know that, um, and, and just, uh, this was not, my wife does not suffer schizophrenia. She suffers by a, a form of bipolar. But these are uh, illnesses that, that can be with, with the right treatment and the right support and the right work can be, can be effectively treated and managed. And, you know, you can live happily ever after, uh, which at the time was almost impossible to believe when we were struggling through it. I loved your book. And, you know, I've read many, many books about family stories. And I, I'm really glad we have you on here because I haven't read one uh, about that talked in depth about being a spouse and then also having your kids. And I was 10 when my grandmother went to the state hospital in our town and your kids are nine and 11. So I was really honed in on how you handled this with your kids. And you, like my family, your initial inclination was let's not tell anybody about what's going on in our family. But then you blossomed, whereas my family kept that, let's not tell anybody, you know, for the rest of my parents' life. Right. Um, could you tell our audience how you handled, uh, you know, once you got past that momentary um, glitch <laughs> yeah. Yeah. with your kids? Because I thought it was wonderful and open and honest and really healthy for them. Yeah, th thank thank you for that. Yeah, I did. I am embarrassed at, at the beginning how I I felt I was handling it so well, and then at the end I said, "Let's not tell anyone." The challenge when it's it's your spouse, and and given that the stigma is 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 prevalent and can have real repercussions on someone, it's that um, you know I I felt like it wasn't really my decision to share that my wife was sick. It was really her decision to make, but at the time she, she it was not, I mean, her brain wasn't functioning. So I couldn't communicate with her. I couldn't sit down and say, Hey, do you, do you want to keep the secret or do you want to share this? She, you know, she was a, uh, she was practicing medicine and, and, you know, it could have, it could have uh, real serious uh, results. So that was my initial inclination. And also just because you're kind of taught, you got to keep this stuff quiet. So I was really focused on keeping it all secret and, and hidden. Um, my wife was very sick for a long time and th that just fell off my list of things that I was concerned about. I, I, I just couldn't deal with everything. And when I, and I mentioned this in the book that when, when people started finding out, what I realized was as a society, the stigma is very real, but when it comes to individuals, so many families, so many people are affected by mental illness that uh, so once they find out, all of a sudden people are sharing their stories and they're, you know, and they're, and they're compassionate and, and they're being supportive. And, you know, that just became the way that we decided as a family, we were going to uh, you know, approach this. And it's been really wonderful. I mean, look, these, these are terrible illnesses and, and it was a real struggle and I, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but I mean, the, the great thing about it is that our family has a very open communication now about our mental health. We all have therapists. We all take mental health very seriously. And that all comes out of, of that period where, and really just, I mean, the challenge with kids that young is you don't really know what you should share and what you shouldn't share and what, what they're understanding and, and what they're not. And, and that's the real challenge, but I decided to approach it as if I were in their shoes and I, I would want answers. I would want to know what's going on with mom. Is she going to get better? Um, 
how should we think about this? And, and to not feel ashamed because, you know, the more I thought, the more it sunk in, I realized that most of all, my wife doesn't want the kids to be ashamed of her and they shouldn't be. No, if, if my wife had cancer, they wouldn't be ashamed that she was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it's really not any different. I mean, the brain is an organ when it suffers an illness, it, people get sick, but that doesn't mean we should treat them any differently with any less support or compassion than we would any with, in any other illness. So that really became the mantra. And um, yeah, it, look, it, my kids are great kids and they, they, we all suffered through it. I think, you know, and that becomes clear in the book. We all had our issues and we all needed help ourselves to deal with it. Me being the holdout and the very last one until I finally recognized, yeah, I guess I need some help too. Um, but yeah, it, 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 thank you for saying that. Um, I, I, yeah. I think I recovered pretty, pretty well after a shaky start. My sister and I whispered and talked about it all the time. She was one year older. She was, I was 10, she was 11. So kids are going to be talking about it, worrying about it. And how I wish my parents had asked me what you asked your kids, you know, tell, ask me any question and I will yeah. answer. So thank you. Yeah. Mimi, you you keep nodding your head, so I want to know what's going it, on in it that head. It resonates so much, and it's interesting to put the template of it's your spouse, not your child, over that, and it's different, but it's really not that different. And you know, we all have that learning curve in the beginning. Where I mean, in my book, I look back at some of this stuff, and I go, "Oh my God!" I mean, I was the worst character in the book. You know, it was just like I didn't know what I was doing. But I think that that's that's what most everybody goes through. I'm wondering now that you're at your happy ending, is there something that you wish you had known sooner? There's so, that so much I wish I... Everything. Right? <laughs> I mean, look, there, there's so much. I mean, that's a, that's a long answer to a short question. Um, obviously, I wish that I would have been open and honest sooner in the ordeal. It would have made it not, I mean, look, these, it's never easy, but it, it would have made it less stressful if I wasn't trying to hide everything. And like I said, uh, friends, uh, Hey, would, Hey, I've been, I've suffered psychosis too. Um, so it, you know, it was, it was like the people come out of the woodwork and you realize, Oh, wait, I'm not, a, we're not alone. And this affects so many families. I guess the other thing is I wish that I wasn't so scared of psychosis because that first day, that first week, I was really, it was very frightening to me. I yeah, had so never... what was, tell us, you know, because we read the book, but so you're, it, from what I remember, it was sort of ramping up, like she wasn't sleeping and she was saying weird things and things were happening at work and she really had some paranoia going on. She thought there was a plot and she was obsessing about details and, you know, eventually you did psych, you know, psychiatrist roulette until you found yeah. someone who could help you. You know, we all did the medication roulette and the psychiatrist yeah, exactly. roulette and, yeah. you know, um, well but it sounded, yeah. you know, I, I'm imagining your children, nine and 11, and the other characters in your book, your, your in-laws and your siblings and, and a lot of secrecy at first. But it it was frightening what she was doing. It was no little thing. She, you know, she said, we have to kill the dog. Uh, you know, she thought the devil, there's a lot about devil worship. And yeah, so yeah. You know, if you're yeah. listening, psychosis is different for everybody and it is terrifying. And in your happy ending, I know you had to relive that to to write the book. Yeah. And there's there's a scene in here that just I think you're a, a little bit into it. And when you began to understand, when you took your kids aside, when you were about to read them their book and said, before I read to you, can you, let's talk, would you like to talk about mom? And they said they would, and they're little, they're like nine and 11. And, and you explained to them that like when you have a cold, your nose is running and it doesn't work properly. So mommy's brain is hurting. So her brain isn't working properly. And, um, and then the kids start nodding. It's like she has a cold, but the cold is in her brain. She can't control it. 
Yeah. Yeah. I thought well, that was brilliant. You know, Mon- that was, that was a thing. dad trying his best to, to, to explain something that's very difficult to explain. Yeah, but at I, least wish you could, open. I wish we could just explain it to many adults in such a simple fashion, because that's what it is. And that's what so many people just don't get. Yeah. And again, not helped by pop culture because people are used to watching horror films and reading Stephen King novels. And and the media is sure to jump on the very small percent of people that are dangerous with psychosis. And yet, really, we don't hear any stories about it. it in all honesty, my wife, she did become belligerent at times, for sure. And that's in the book. But because she was scared and and any and because what she was thinking, she really believed it. So, yes, yeah, she was raised in a very religious family. The, the devil was a very real thing to her, you know, growing up. and. In somewhere in that in that paranoid psychosis, the devil was all of a sudden, you know, in our dog, and then he could could travel through people through line of sight. And you know, it's hard it's hard to believe, you know, that she, it, it's hard to think she believed that. She's a very very smart, intelligent person, and even she would say, "I actually thought that, you know, I might I that was real to me." So when the devil and I, you know, the devil was kind of bouncing around our house, and I just was concerned that, uh oh, if the devil ever bounces into me, we're going to have some real problems here. And then, of course, didn't take too long before that happened. Well, if you actually think that your husband is possessed by the by the devil, you're going to be scared. You're going to try to run away. And there's nothing that I could say or do or anyone could say or do to make her think that that wasn't real. So she was terrified and she wasn't dangerous. She was really, really scared. And, uh, you know, that I think one of the I think one of the things that really helped me get through it is that her behavior, her personality, her actions were so different than the person that she is, the person that I knew for over 20 years, the person that I built my life around. It was so different that I knew it was the illness that was doing this. It wasn't her. And so I really. Eh, Throughout the entire experience, I just kept reminding myself, this is not your wife. This is the illness. And even with the kids, guys, this is not mom. Mom is, mom is not treating you like this. Mom is not acting like this. It is because she has an illness. And we have to keep that. And we have to remember that. We have to give her, you know, show her our patience and our support like we would anyone who's suffering with some kind of disease. And, um, and so that, yeah, so that, um, just keeping that in mind and 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 making sure that that you know she she was safe and even if she was mad or I, mean, I think and again you each one of you in your book also had to deal with this where sometimes someone who's so sick they're best when they're not with you right what they need to be in a place where people trained can 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 monitor them and they can be safe and frankly you can get a little break and it's mm-hmm. sad when that happens, but you know, we, we had to deal with that too. So not not easy, but <clears throat> but you know, so long as you don't give up, you can you can get through it. And one thing he said, said was everything is, you know, there were so many similarities. And I took actually great, I, I shouldn't say I chuckled, but I took great pleasure in finding that you as a spouse, a man, you know, ran into a lot of the same problems that that we mothers do. But I did notice one difference. And I think it was it is a difference. And you said on page 218, I actually wrote it down because I wanted to ask you about it or to have us discuss it. You said psychiatrists will always forgive a spouse and they wish they saw more of that, you know, when you're advocating for your loved one and you got so frustrated that you, you know, you were what in polite society, you know, might be called rude to the staff. And all yeah. of us mothers have done that. And probably every mother has done that. But I wonder how often we get told that um, the psychiatrists will always forgive a mother and we wish we saw more of that. Um, I see Mimi and Randy smiling a little bit at that. So um, 
I guess I just want some discussion of that, maybe from all three of us, but I just, I was really struck by that. And I want that to apply to mothers too, when in the thinking of psychiatrists. Yeah, I look, I think that particular psychiatrist, um, we got really lucky uh, with, with that psychiatrist. He uh, was someone that we were referred to and we were seeing, and it just so happened he was the head psychiatrist at our local crisis unit who actually then saw my wife when the, the couple times that she had to go in. Um, and he was incredible. I mean, I could text him at any time during the night and he, he would respond. Now, I don't know if he would do that for, for, for a mom and, and her child. I, I, I have no idea, but, but we, I, I, there weren't, I don't think there are many psychiatrists that, that would do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's, there, I'm, I'm sure men are treated different than women. And I, I mean, I know it across most of the, the, the world. So I, I can assume that that that's probably real. So did you feel like you had any other advantages as a spouse or as a male, or maybe you have nothing to compare it with, so you wouldn't have thought of that? Well, I certainly know that I had advantages because we had financial resources that uh, a lot of people wouldn't have. And it's not that we're wealthy, but, you know, we did, I, I mean, I, I did benefit from a very supportive employer, um, a health uh, we, we had a health insurance that unbeknownst to me did not cover any of this, which is a whole other topic we can talk about. And we can talk about Patrick Kennedy and his battle for parity. Yeah. God bless him. But I mean, you know, we could afford to go through this and not have to declare bankruptcy. Um, I could afford to take some time off of work and advocate for my wife and my kids. That's a real privilege. And um, I, I, I was aware of that the whole time. I, I don't frankly know how people can can get through something like this that that don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. In terms of being a, a spouse or a husband or something, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe this, they don't see a lot of husbands that um, go go to battle. I, I don't know the answer to that. I do think I had an advantage when I was dealing with those bills for the insurance because as a business person, I knew that an insurance company wasn't gonna pay the price that they were charging me. And I knew what an insurance company was gonna pay. So I just basically called and said, I'm not paying this, I'll, I'll pay you X and that's it. And they, they quickly agreed. So I, there were certainly advantages that I had. Um, I guess I would turn that back to you. You read the book and you have experienced a similar situation. How would you, how would you, how would you answer the question? Well, I, I, I also thought you were at a huge disadvantage, you know, being a spouse, because the rest of us can go home if we have a spouse and, and have a partner in all this tragedy and trying to figure everything out. And when you're, when it is your spouse, you are all alone. And then you also have your kids who maybe your, your wife, when it, in the case of a wife was like a lot of wives, maybe doing more with the kids and knew all about what they should be doing. So I also had great empathy for you because it was your partner and you called her your best friend. Um, so. Yeah, I think that that would be true, whether it's a husband or wife that, you know, when you, you build your foundation of your life around someone and you do that because you, you love so much about them. You love the way they, even, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, one thing that has been said and before is you, and I think it was in my book maybe, but you really fall in love with a person's brain. I mean, it's kind of funny to say that, but you really do. I mean, you, you fall in love with their personality and their humor and the way that they think and the way they approach things. And I mentioned this in the book, when, when we got married, I thought to myself, I'll never be alone again. Like, I, you know, there's going to be tough times in life, but I'll always have this wonderful supportive person to help me through it. And then I had this ordeal that lasted years where I was alone. I didn't have that person. And it's even worse because I know, I know her so well and we built our lives around our kids and, and I knew, you know, and all we wanted was to build a loving home and a supportive place for our kids to, to grow up. And she would be crushed. I, I mean, going through it, I just knew she would be crushed to see 
how her behavior and her actions were affecting our kids. It would it was heartbreaking to to watch it, and it's not her fault. Obviously, it's far from her fault, but that was really really hard. And you know, I'm Randy. You mentioned you know a call you got from someone who read your book. I have had people reach out to me who are spouses going through. Never had a husband actually, but several wives. And you know, that's one thing that we talk about, which is uh, especially with young kids like that. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's so hard to watch someone who, you know, only wants the best for your kids, put them in situations and, 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 and do these actions that are causing them such tremendous stress. I mean, that's, that was, yeah, that, Mindy, that was one of the hardest things about it. Did yeah. you ever feel that your kids were in danger? I know. I never felt that they were in danger. No, I never did. Um, I think, well, let me, let me adjust that. I think, look, my wife at some points was on so much medication that she really wasn't supposed to be driving. In fact, one of the issues is we took her keys away and she was livid with us because, you know, we wouldn't let her drive and that really hampered her independence. But, you know, again, she was on so much medication. It was, it was really the, well, it was the, um, you know, the sleeping medication and the Ativan and stuff that it wasn't the antipsychotics necessarily, but until we, we were able to titrate that down, we really couldn't let her drive. So I would have been concerned if she would have been driving the kids when she was on the medication. I never felt they were endangered because of her illness. I never did. Because you mentioned the thing about the dog and it, I extrapolated that out like right away. I thought, uh Oh, and then what happens when she thinks the kid is, uh, possessed you know I had a moment in my life with my son when this was all starting when my husband said you know Mimi maybe we should like put the knives like away and I was so appalled that he said that to me you know because it it addressed and questioned Nick's very you know the very who he was I, yeah. you know I just knew that Nick O'Rourke is not somebody who would you have to be afraid of with a knife. But again, it's that disease is so big and it takes over the brain and the brain is who you are. So you lose who the person is and it's terrifying. It is terrifying. And that particular situation happened about a week into the, the psychotic, the first uh, episode of psychosis. And she said that to me, um, she, you know, she was never, she was never going to act on that. I think she was reaching out to me for help because she was really scared that, you know, the devil was here and, you know, somehow the devil had gotten into our dog. I mean, she, I, I guarantee you, she was never going to act on that. And as I got more comfortable with the psychosis and I got more experience dealing with it, I really was not scared of it anymore. Mm -hmm. Again, my wife, um, it, and I don't know, I'm sure, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but my wife is by nature just extremely uh, patient and caring and kind and friendly. And she's not, she's, you know, she's not aggressive in any way. So I, I, I kind of, at, after, you know, weeks of this, I just felt like, you know, that it's not, we, we don't have to be scared of her psychosis. It's more, um, recognizing how scared she can be with her psychosis. Right. And I think I'm that's really important. But on the other side of the coin, for though I have to say, I read in the paper all the time, families who say we just never, you know, they knew the person was psychotic. They knew the person was, you know, not taking their meds or whatever, but they never thought they would ever oh, you know, yeah. people at the supermarket or something. So families are broadsided all the time. So, and they are good families too. So I just have to get that in there. My son had delusions as well that I was the devil. Or I remember something. that in your book. I do. And remember. I was afraid of him and yeah. we did our knives away <laughs> and he never actually ever did anything to anybody, but I don't, um, I don't guarantee for anybody that psychosis isn't something you have to consider those things. Yeah. yeah and there's a I, part in the book where that psychiatrist tells me, Hey, you need to you need to understand that this it can be way more serious than than what you think. Mm -hmm. I love that we're having this discussion for for so many reasons because it's real and it's raw and it's honest and um without really asking 
you've shared the thing that I think many spouses listening to the show need to hear. And that is, and, and when we did our show about siblings, it was there as well, because this person that was supposed to be your best friend, as you know, you have more than one kid. I'm sure you think your kids hope your kids are going to be close always, and they'll have kids and they'll be cousins. And so when, when you, when you lose a sibling to mental illness, you're usually young and it's hard to understand. And so that's a certain kind of loss. But when I have taught family to family for NAMI, usually about 80% of the people are parents because they're the ones that feel they have control and they can do something and they're going to learn and they're going to fix their kid. But we do get siblings and we do get spouses in the class. And there's a class near the end where we ask, okay, siblings, what do you want everybody to know about what you feel that's unique to being a sibling? And then we do the same for the partners and spouses. And that comes up again and again. I built my life around this person. And I know every chapter in your book, you start with a brief section of your, your initial love story and then go back to the to your struggles with the mental illness. And I remember one person in the NAMI family to family class saying, I don't know, my husband's in the hospital and I had to be Santa Claus. I had to dress up like Santa Claus so my kids could have Christmas. And if he was in the hospital with cancer, the kids could understand it and go visit. But when something's wrong with the brain, and I'm so glad that you learned to be open with your children about it, but you never know what they're feeling or how they're feeling in the gaps until things are explained to them. So this is it says a lot about what you learned about being a parent, but it is lonely. And the big thing is that when they don't know they're ill and they don't want our help, and there's a couple of places in the book where you kind of land on the same runway with her and you say, okay, let's deal with this. You know, you were trying to figure out that she thought there was some plot at work and you were trying to help her recreate the timeline. And uh, these are some of the things we all have to learn. But at, I'm so, so happy for you that you're back in a good place and you all got the help you needed and you you found the medication that worked and you went for help yourself and the struggle goes on, I'm sure. The striving for a good marriage goes on. But if you were to talk to the other, sp other spouses listening or partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, you stuck it out. And, but let's talk about the burdens and you've mentioned them, you know, the the financial burdens and also just the subjective burdens, feelings of guilt, feelings of like, what would you say is unique to spouses besides like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to build my life around this person. Like you've lost your, like Mindy was saying, we could go home and talk to our husbands about it or our friends, but she's your best friend and you couldn't talk to her about it until she could come around and accept it. So what would you like everyone else to know about the, what's unique to being a, a spouse or partner? And someone gets ill. Well, I, I think the the challenge, and I, I talk about this in the book, is it's very easy to become a caregiver and forget that you're actually a spouse. And it's difficult to, um, when you've been through so much trauma, it's, it's difficult to let your guard down and, and work on the relationship again, because every relationship takes work. And you have to, it's a joint effort. And if you're just sitting there watching for the first sign of psychosis and ready with the medication, ready to go, you're not really a spouse. You're, you're not, you're, you're, just a, you're just another member of her psychiatric team. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not healthy. It's not a healthy relationship. It's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for her. So you have to, get to a point, both of you, where you accept that this is an illness, it's not going away, but it can be treated. And mm -hmm. it's part of who your spouse is. And you need to love that part of them, just like you do every other part. And if you really love the person, I mean, look, my wife is the same person that she was. Sure, we're all a little different for having gone through this, and she has to take medication, and she has to watch her sleep and her stress levels and all that, then I have to support her with that. But it's worth it because we have the life that we wanted to have. We, our kids are happy, they're healthy, they, we, we have a great relationship with our kids. They're, they're productive members of society. We are, we have a very loving home and 
it's great. It, it, and, and almost like I, it's very easy, I think, sometimes to take that for granted, to take your health for granted, to take your kids for granted, to take your happiness for granted. But when you've been through hell, like we have, there doesn't an hour go by that I don't think, man, are we lucky. We are so lucky that we've got this time. And I guess I, what I'd say to spouses is don't give up. It's an illness. Your love, the person you love is still there. And to your point, you kind of have to play, you know, past the psychiatrist and try different medications. And, you know, we, we ultimately went to McLean Hospital. It's the only way that we solved the problem. Uh, you know, local psychiatrists couldn't do it. Again, were we privileged to have the resources to go to McLean? Of course. But, you know, you just can't, you just can't give up. Another way that I thought you were privileged, but there's lots of people that have good families that help, but I thought you had such a wealth of family members that helped even um, Mia's brother, Luke, you know, that dropped everything in his life and came and lived with you for a few weeks and helped take care of the kids and the house. And I just thought uh, that was very heartwarming to me to read all of that. I would have loved to have had even one of those people, you know, helping our family at that time. I did have my husband, of course, um, but um, but I just thought that, you know, your extended family was incredible. No, yeah, no kidding. And, you know, she woke up psychotic and we were actually visiting my her brother, who's an emergency room doctor. Otherwise, I would have been completely at a loss. And Did you she, say she was 39? Yeah. That's old to have a first break, huh? Very, very unusual. Yeah. Yeah. That, again, that's why that's why we were so blindsided. Yeah. You know, people, I think they, they I mean, obviously, this affects a lot of people in their teens and their early 20s and things like that. But your your the latest episode, Kat Thompson said this can, you know, psychosis can affect any of us under the right conditions. And it's true. Again, another reason why we should be empathetic and supportive of people that go through this, because it can affect any of us. Not related to being a spouse, but um, if, you know, all those frustrating parts of the mental health system that you ran into that made it so hard to get help for her, when you knew that you wanted to be involved, you should be involved, and people, you were worried. The part that struck me the most of all those roadblocks was when she needed to be somewhere, but because they were voluntary programs, she could just walk out if she decided to, and then you wouldn't even know where she was, or she wouldn't be getting any care. Of all those, that's, to me, just really rang true. Um, of all the things you ran into, what do you think was the worst? If you could change one thing about all those kind of roadblocks that we've been discussing, what would that one thing be? Uh, for me, when she was in the crisis center and I couldn't even visit her, I mean, I couldn't visit her until she consented to see me. I, that was really so hard. Just sitting in that waiting room for hours and hours and hours, knowing that she was somewhere locked away, scared. I, and I, you know, as, as hard as it is to be with your loved one when they're psychotic, at least you feel like you're there for them. And when you can't be, and there was no way she was going to sign a, I mean, at that point, sign a release, and there's no way, right? So that I'm was- I'm not telling anything to the devil. You can forget that. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I mean, that that's part of your book made me cry because you, there you were, this earnest, loving husband, and she was this wonderful person who would never deny you visiting her if she was in her right mind. But then you went there day after day and were turned away. I just thought it was so- sad and very poignant. You know, thanks. Yeah, it was, it was, that was really hard. And it, it would have changed. Like, I'm, I mean, we're married, we share our lives together and yet I can't see her. I mean, I, I guess there's rules for it and they must make sense, but it was. Hard. No, they don't make sense. No, no, no. They don't make sense. They need to change. There's no two ways about that. Yeah. That was, that was the hardest part of, of that. I mean, look, Dealing with insurance companies is not fun, but it's something that we all have to do, whether it's a mental illness or other illness. Insurance companies are hard. Um, but that, yeah, that was that was that was really difficult. 
I think we can do a lot better in that regard. I, I so love your openness and honesty in this discussion. I think you probably because you're talking to three moms, but I don't know if Patrick Kennedy got you to talk about your feelings the way we have. But um, I think that what you have to say is is going to help a lot of people to hear, you know, your commitment and your love and also the honesty of what your family went through. And I especially love the empathy for Mia and what it must have felt like inside her brain to believe the things that she believed were true. And I know that empathy is a huge part. And when your loved one is pushing you away, it's difficult. So thank you for sharing that. We're nearing the end of our time and it has gone very fast. And I I want to find out what the reaction to the book has been, where you are right now, and anything else you want us or spouses to know? I know that's a lot of questions, but okay. right. So the book has been out for a while, right? A yeah, few months? For two years. Two years? Really? Uh, two years. Uh, the printed book, the audio book came out over the summer. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the reaction has been great. I mean, I look, I we self-published our book. There was no way any agent or publishing company was going to do this because I don't have any kind of following or anything. I'd never written a book. I didn't think I'd ever write a book. Um, it was, I had to do it. If you've read the book, you know, I had to do it for my own therapy. It was yep. incredibly helpful for me to process. I was diagnosed with PTSD. I've actually... Uh, several people with PTSD have contacted me um, and they've said that the book's been helpful. So the reaction has been great. Look, the people who I think find value from it are finding it. And it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's, that's the reason you do this is you get that email or you get that call and someone says, thank you so much. And mm-hmm. so that's been great. Um, we did do a, an audio book version. Um, if anyone's listening and they want a copy, if they just go to my website, patrickdillon.com and, and, and send an email, I'm, I'd be happy to send them a free copy of the audiobook. Super thrilled that we convinced Raul Esparza to do the narration. He's such a talented actor. And uh, so we're real proud of that. So I guess, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for letting me come on. I, I really appreciate everything that you, the three of you do in terms of advocacy. So um Really, I'm honored to be here and, and thanks so much. Thank you. Just uh, they, <laughs> tell us the website and tell us the title of the book one more time. Uh, the website safe. is patrickdillon.com and it's Safe, Wanted, and Loved is the name of the book. Okay. And you and thank your to- wife too, because um, the part where she wanted you to write the book, that she wanted this story to get out to help people, I thought was exemplary. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it wouldn't wouldn't have been finished. The book would never would have been finished without her. So I'll let definitely let her know. Through partners, any final words to the spouses out there listening? That you you keep saying in your book, don't give up. But anything else to add? Um, there can be happy endings. It's hard to believe at times, but mm-hmm. there can be a happy ending. Great. Patrick Dillon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Take care. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.